Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, John chapter 6, uh, look at verse 51. Jesus, uh, this is a conversation that I'm picking up in the middle of. It, it actually is occurring in Capernaum. Those of you that are going to Israel with us, okay, we're going to be standing right in, the, in this town. Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, it was a contentious conversation that Jesus was having. Because there were people in the crowd that were trying to pull down what he was saying. Okay, and then his disciples were there too. And what the, what the contentious people were doing is they had a tendency to sort of uh, interrupt with their unbelief. Which you'll see this happen. Look at verse 51. Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... I th- I think it's interesting that just two chapters before in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, and he was talking about living water. Amen. Okay. So, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, uh, we're, we have talked about the fact that The new covenant Jesus introduced, or you could say he passed the new covenant to his disciples in the form of these two elements, which he's about to talk about in that passage. The bread is the symbol of his broken body. The cup is the symbol of his shed blood. Okay, so Jesus makes this statement, I'm the living bread. If you eat my flesh, you'll live forever. And verse 52, as you might expect, it says, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, who was also a scholar, uh, balked at the idea of being born again. He tripped over the same obstacle. Remember, he said, back to Jesus, he said, how am I going to be born again? Am I I going to enter the second time into my mother's womb? So what, what these scholars are struggling with here is the statement that Jesus said, eat my flesh. Very next verse, he is like, well, if you think that's something, you're going to eat, have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus said, verily, verily, this is verse 53, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, they were sitting there struggling with the natural part of this. Okay, and uh, if you were not with us last week, you can always get these messages uh, by going to the info desk, praise, and they'll give you the whole thing. If you wait until it goes on the website, you can download the whole thing in a podcast. But what we talked about is the fact that there's more than one language being spoken here in these passages. Jesus said in John chapter 10 that my sheep hear my voice and they follow. So Jesus would stand up in a crowd of people, tell a parable, okay, which uh, had meaning, of course, but he wouldn't bother with explaining the parable. And then he would turn around and just walk away from the crowd. Okay, his disciples would get him over to the side, you know, Jesus, that that doesn't look good on Facebook. I mean, uh, you know, would you mind explaining yourself? I'm just having fun. Come on now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what Jesus said was, well, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Now, so the reason why God didn't have a problem with, with, you know, Jesus is God. uh, God and Jesus didn't have a problem with him talking like that to people in this language of spiritual things was because of the simple fact, my sheep hear my voice and they follow. I really believe that Jesus could have been speaking in a foreign language. 
and God's people would have still been able to hear his voice and would have followed him because of his voice, not because they understood what he was saying. See, in, in our culture, understanding is, is the key to whether or not we believe something. Okay, so, so people want to understand it, and then they'll decide that they're going to believe it. And that's all in the head. It's called mental assent, which means if I agree with what you're saying, then that means I believe it. Thing that you need to understand, that's not Bible believing. That's not believing. As a matter of fact, often God will go around your understanding to get faith out of you first so he can then grant you understanding based upon your faith that you already have. Who are you out there today? Okay, so these, uh, these scholars were falling into this trap, this understanding trap. Okay, now Jesus is going to try to help them. Okay, but uh, it kind of got worse. Verse 54 he said, whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, this, this was not some kind of, it shouldn't have been a foreign thing for them, just like Nicodemus. They were Bible scholars. They were all covenant men. So they should have understand, understood covenant language. They went through this thing every year. So what was it about this that they didn't get? Their heads were in the way, and, and I, in actuality, they had already, even though they were born the natural seed of Abraham, they had already drifted off into opposition to God, Jesus pointed out to them. Are you out there? Hallelujah. This will answer a lot of questions for you. So the New Testament shows us there's both a natural seed and a spiritual seed of Abraham. How many of you believe in Jesus? By your own testimony right there, do it again. You're saying you're the, the spiritual seed of Abraham. I'm of the seed of Abraham, and his blessing rests on me. I'm of the seed of Abraham. I'm not moved by what I see. Jesus is made a surety. And that's what I believe. I'm the seed of Abraham. And his seed remains in me. Woo! God is not concerned about losing you because of what he put in you. Now, now this, this might be new for you. You can actually wander off and he's still not concerned because he knows what he put in you. And all it's going to take is the sound of the master's voice. See, this is how he says he draws his people so you, you might, you know, get put in with a bunch of goats and end up in the world, all these names and all these things hanging on you. But the reason why God is not concerned is because when the master sounds his voice, if you are his, you hear his voice and you just walk right out Probably many of you have testimony of that in your life. You're trying to figure out, how did I get out of that? Well, he led you out. Ooh, come on now, can somebody out there say amen? So all of this is working in this passage of Jesus dealing with his disciples and with these other people. I'll just go ahead and call them goats. You know, not derogatory, uh, that Jesus called them goats. Ooh, come on and say, they said, but, 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 
but eat your flesh and drink your blood, but, 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 how are we going to do that? But, but, you hear the goat in that? How many of you hear the goat? <laughs> Woo, I'm having fun. Praise the name of Jesus. Somebody out there ought to say, hey, but that's what a goat sounds like. Okay, then verse 56, Jesus said, He that eats my flesh and drinks my, my blood dwells in me and I in him. That's very similar to what he told the woman at the well. Very similar to what he told uh, Nicodemus. He said, As the living Father has sent me and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna. Manna was natural bread. And those people are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. He's talking about himself. Okay, so he's still talking covenant language. See, if, if they had been listening spiritually to what he was saying, they would have realized he was referring to the communion table, that they had a practice of going through this every year. Okay, are you still out there? Praise the Lord. And this happens to be the thing that Jesus delivered to his disciples. So the quick way of looking at it is he wasn't talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood literally. He was talking about believing in him. Woo. Now, but you can see the snare. Now, I, I like to read verse 60 to you. Uh, he says, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? So it says, many of the disciples fell away from Jesus at that time. Okay, and, and so uh, they were disciples, but I'd, I'd go out on a limb and just say they're just goats. Forgive me if that's too blunt for you. They didn't really believe. Hallelujah. So Jesus was calling his own together. And it is a selection process. Now, I, I can tell that you kind of got shocked by that. You know, I, I'm not the one that makes the decision and neither are you. Who believes? Well, the Bible does tell us that whom he did foreknow them he also did predestinate. Foreknowledge tells me that from before the foundation of the world, God already knew who was going to accept Jesus and who was not. We're talking New Testament here. Come on now. Are you out there? Now, now some, you know, you have to let go of some of that other thinking. Okay? I didn't write it. You didn't write it. So, but anyway, these disciples fell away from Jesus because they choked on the thought of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Most people would who didn't know the language. Okay? But the, those scholars should have known. They were the ones who were responsible for teaching this to the people. And they went through the practice of it every year. Come on, are you out there? So um, Jesus had in Capernaum what we call a Gideon's revival. You know, Gideon had too many people. <laughs> hey, it's in the, in the book of Genesis. Too many people. Praise the news. Praise the Lord. Yeah. He had too many, and then God said, you got too many. And he said, do this, and he got it down to 300. That's a Gideon's revival. Come on now. Now, so if something comes up on the inside of you and say, I, but I'm, I'm not going to go away, okay. That's exactly what happened with Peter. So when, when they fell away, Jesus turned to his disciples and said, well, are you going to go away too? Now listen to Peter's answer. He said, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of life. So in other words, what he was saying is, I don't have to understand it. And I would say, good, 
possibility Peter didn't understand it. But he believed it because he could hear it. Come on, are you, are you, how many of you see that? Okay, so he could hear Jesus' voice. My sheep hear my voice and they follow. Hallelujah. God is good. Okay, so uh, Jesus is talking to you and I about your soul. Now, I want to say it to you again. You, you, you know, people get condemned, okay, because we don't always have the best track record, okay? But, but if you're his, he's going to be calling you back. Now, I realize I'm talking to a room of people that are sitting in church. But if you're concerned about people that you've known that seem to have fallen away, Okay, it's not over yet. See, this is the story of the prodigal son. Don't ever write off a prodigal. Woo, thank you, Lord Jesus. Can somebody say amen? So, well, why do people struggle with those things? Well, here, here's a little insight for you. Natural things people stumble over. So people stumble over communion elements. You know, they try to make it into something that it's not. It's representative. You're not actually going to eat his body or drink his blood. But you're going to believe in him. How many of you follow that? It's representative. So let's, let's just have a little fun with this. This is a big loaf of bread. We use little wafers. Is this bread holy because it's big? Got it? How many of you are following that? Okay, people make holy things out of, out of objects. Okay, and so then they deify objects like the communion elements, like the waters of baptism. Okay, like certain days. Now this is going to shock you. The New Testament tells us there are no holy days. Now it goes on to say if you want to have a holy day, you can call it a holy day and it's holy to you. But God didn't call it a holy day. Are you following that? So, oh, these are holy communion elements. Okay, let, let me tell you about something. I, I heard this years ago. Um, people in California, there was this big outpouring of the Spirit in California back in the 70s where a bunch of people got saved. They had this mass baptismal service on the beach. So, I mean, it's the ocean water. Is it holy water? And then so somebody said, why don't we have a giant communion service on the beach? And, and so they said, well, you know, just impromptu? How, what, what? So they said, well, you know, the only thing we have is saltine crackers and Coca-Cola. And they had a giant communion service on the beach. Are you following that? Is there a holiness problem? No, not from God's perspective. You might make it holy, but he didn't make it holy. In actuality, when you read through the New Testament, as far as objects are concerned, there's only two things on earth that are holy objects. Your physical body, because you're the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the body of Christ. How many of you are with that? All the rest of it is man-made. Traditions of men. Ooh, I'm glad I came to church today. So, you know, people try to say, oh, it's the way you baptize them. Really? 
You know, that's, that's funny. It, it, uh, you go through the book of Acts and there's no specific way that people were baptized. <laughs> uh, hallelujah. It's like standing and praying. Okay, you, you study through the New Testament. Okay, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You mean if I'm in my car, I can't pray? Are you with that? Wow, there wouldn't be a lot of praying going on if it, if it only happened at home by your bed <laughs> at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Bless mama and daddy and all the missionaries in Africa. Thank you, Lord. Now that's a, you know, that's a local tradition. The reason why you could identify with it is strong possibility you were raised that way. Is it bad? No, but it's just not, you know, <laughs> it's not the Lord's Prayer, you know, but is it the Lord's Prayer? You know, we called it the Lord's Prayer. How many of you are with that? Okay, Sunday is not a holy day. Then somebody came along and said, well, it's Saturday because that's the real Sabbath. Oh, but I guess you forgot to read the book of Hebrews. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Are you there? Am I stepping on the sacred cow? Come on now. But it's time to go ahead and, and let, let, come on now. You know, let, let's come on out of these things. See, if your faith is based, here, here's the thing. If, if your faith is based on an object, what happens if the building burns down? What happened to your faith? Are you with that? Amen. So, uh, God is a spirit, and we relate to him spirit to spirit. See, when you start adding these elements to it that are not even in the Bible, it, it complicates the operation of your faith and actually eventually gets you to the place where you're depending on seeing things a certain way. So then you have to see it to believe it, like Thomas. That's not true Bible faith. Now, Jesus ingratiated Thomas uh, he, he actually, he came back to, to visit with the disciples and Thomas had to be, happened to be there. But he, he took the time to show Thomas, look, Thomas, you know, uh, put your finger into my hand and thrust your hand into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Are, are you out there? Now, I, I understand that I, I might have just really rattled your world this morning, okay, Christmas is not a holy day. Why, you know, different parts of the world, they, they observe, Christians observe Christmas on a different day. Are they wrong? Hallelujah, December the 25th. Wonder where that came from. I don't know. Are you, are you with this? Hallelujah. So your faith, see, that this is what Jesus was showing his disciples. See, that the, the scribes and Pharisees were stumbling over the very thing that they would stumble over, the natural thing. They never even got past the conversation in Capernaum. Okay? But his disciples were all the way to the communion table with him seated on one side and them on the other side, and then when he served them, it was an action of them believing. It was about believing. It wasn't about the bread. 
You know, we don't even use uh, real wine in this church for communion. I don't drink alcohol. It could be Coke. <laughs> the communion elements are a symbol. It's a representation. Hallelujah. It's what you believe that's transferred. Glory to God.